Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, this no no questions. I all I will go to the wiki. So there is ton of resources on uh, on internet about functional programming and about Haskell and about um, and about Rust and about Golang. You're kind of learning Golang now as well. Uh, I encourage you to watch them. Uh, I will put some some talks that I liked uh, on the on the wiki on the course wiki. Uh, so the, I've already put three. Uh, there is a talk which is about composition. Um, composition is very important topic in functional programming, functional thinking. And this guy has a number of talks, and he is he is a very good teacher. He he explains things very well and he gives kind of a graphical examples. Um, so I encourage you to watch his talks. Um, unfortunately, he is an F-sharp lover, right? So he presents most of his examples in F-sharp, and then you say, oh, come on, it's F-sharp, it's not Haskell, so I, I'm not gonna watch it. Um, the thing is, the concepts are the same. Uh, the fundamental thinking is the same. The only difference is syntax, and the syntax you can actually skip. So uh, you don't need to really understand the syntax of F-sharp examples. And most of the time it's so intuitive that it just highlights the, the concepts. So focus on the concepts, focus on the ideas, uh, not on the syntax itself. And that's, um, that's the biggest message I have for you that uh, this semester, th those programming languages that you're learning, yes, syntax is important because you cannot do anything if, if you don't learn the syntax. Uh, so you do need to memorize some of the syntax and some of the things like how you organize um, the, the sentences, the structure of the program. But the syntax is actually not that important. Uh, what is important that you get the concepts, that you understand other things that you haven't had yet. So for example, functional composition is something that you probably knew from C++ and C, but you didn't really use. Uh, because the imperative languages are not kind of um, promoting that style of programming, whereas in functional programming, that's the primary primary way of programming. Uh, and this concept is a little bit like it's easy, but it's not that easy. It has a bit of a depth and learning about it will kind of help you to, to be a better programmer. Um, so I I know his talks and I, I like all of them. Uh, he's a, a, a very uh, good presenter and he gives good examples. So, so watch his talks. And then the other one which I posted for next week is kind of a summary of, of Haskell. Uh, and this this guy is also a um, good presenter, good, good talker. Uh, and he talks about Haskell and he also talks about uh, Scala uh, and other programming languages. Uh, so uh, check his talks too. And this one is for Haskell, specifically for, for Haskell. And if you watch it next week, it will be good because it kind of goes over most of the features of Haskell that we hope you kind of learn and understand. So if you're watching his talk and you don't get some things, then bring it on, bring, bring the questions to the class and, and we, we can discuss uh, or spend more time on it. Uh, so. Um, check those two guys, and then I will keep posting some other other videos for later. I I also found kind of a, a nice talk. Um, it's 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 not very deep, but it's it's a very nice talk comparing Rust and Haskell. So it's for a, from a person who learned Rust and Haskell, and then compared what are the similarities and what are the the differences. And it's it's a very good talk also. So I kind of encourage you to to check that, but maybe not check it this or next week, check it later on. So that's why it's posted a little bit later. Um, okay, so those are the, um, the main points. Uh, the code for lecture three has been posted to the, uh, to the repository. And funny thing is, uh, remember our think um, implementation that we did? So we had kind of a think implementation that was that was something like this um, without deadline, right? So we, we said, uh, think of a number and it would be this expression and it would always give two. 
And I thought, yeah, that's a kind of a cool, cool way of, um, of writing a property test because this function always gives two. So in the spec, I wrote a property test for it. Uh, and it's, it, it is here. It says, um, describe thing of a number and it says it's a property test. And if I give it anything, uh, and then I, I, I ask think of, of a number and this anything is passed to it, it should always return two. And guess what? My test failed. Uh, and the test failed because the, uh, the property tester, that the uh, quick check, they give, gave me negative numbers and zero and positive numbers, kind of at, at random because it's, it tries to generate some input data at random for your, for your function to test if your invariants are, are kept. And of course it failed because it said for, for, z for zero, it doesn't return two. There is actually an error because there is a division by zero, right? Uh, so if you think of a number and the number is zero, then it would not work. So funny enough, it caught an error that I had to add this extra uh, condition to the implementation of the function, which checks, okay, if the number passed to this function is less than one, I mean, we have to hard code two, otherwise this expression wouldn't work, right? Uh, so this function now returns two no matter what, but it will kind of return two for this case by cheating, right? Not by doing that expression. Uh, so we will talk a little bit about error handling and like what functions take and what is an error. Uh, but this was just an example of catching an error, which we didn't see, but by writing the uh, property invariant, we, we caught it, right? And then I wrote the some, I, I use H, H spec and I wrote some simple tests and it's quite nice if you now go to lecture three and you say uh, stack test because H spec kind of prints the, um, those messages that you use for the, for the tests and it shows you which tests failed and which tests succeeded. Uh, and it is quite nice when you, uh, when you have it working and it kind of uh, prints the, the output here. So we will see it in a, <laughs> in a minute. Okay, so um, let's, let's wait. So we have in total 24 example tests and this line tests all the examples. And then this is the H spec uh, tests that I wrote. And it uh, basically prints, you can nest them. So you can nest your, your descriptions. So I, I have, you know, uh, for example, this is the top level uh, for lecture three. So that, that, says, that says here. And then um, I have a sub, you know, embedded uh, tests for swap three and then embedded tests for replace and embedded tests for think of a number. So they, they kind of keep the indentation. And then I actually have the tests here and then the individual tests have the, the cases. So you can kind of nest it to arbitrary depth the way you want to organize your test suite. And then the testing is uh, pretty straightforward. So have a look and uh, play with this. All right, so what we do today is first, we will play a little bit with the, um, with the functions. So uh, which has to do with IO. So we, so far we were doing functions which were kind of pure. So they were taking some type and returning a type um, or taking multiple parameters and returning something, but we didn't, we didn't do any IO in any of those functions here. Uh, we just did some processing. Um, so when you go to the main, you see that the main returns an IO action. And that is, we will come back to it in, in two weeks, but it is kind of a construct which allows you to group uh, some functionality that normally has side effects in imperative programming. But here it is kind of contained to a construct which is called a monad. Uh, and this monad, you know, helps you to deal in a functional way, in a kind of a pure way and transparently referential way with side effects. Um, so I will not go a lot in the theory here, uh, but 
with with monads and in particular with IO monad, we can do kind of imperative programming because you know if I want something to be printed on the screen and then something else to be printed of this on the screen and the first printing doesn't really return anything, then you know composing it into kind of a functional um, functional code is is possible but it feels kind of weird because what we do we do basically an Im imperative code right so how you do imperative code in in functional languages um you you do it like everything else you have to use kind of functional composition and you have to use the you know chaining of the functions um but it feels a bit weird uh so there is a separate notation for doing that and the notation is called do notation so do notation is used for monads and it allows you to sequence uh, operations that you want to do in particular order in such a way that it feels like imperative programming. But it is not imperative programming. There is no imperative programming in Haskell. It just syntactic sugar to help programmers do imperative code in such a way that it looks uh, more like an imperative program. So for example, if we want to print two things. If we want to print um, um, hello, and then we want to print world. So I can do this. And, um, and that will basically do uh, two things. It will print hello, and then it will print world. And then if I want to ask a user for a name, I can say um, uh, get get line so I can read the line from the um, from the input yeah so it's it's called line and then uh, I can normally when we want to assign something to to some um, uh, some token uh, we use the equality say, uh, sign and we use let so for example if I want to declare uh, an n to be a number, uh, for example, three. So I would say let n equals three uh, or four. And then I can print that as well. So I can put string and I can print what n is, right? Uh, n is, is not a, a string. n is a number. So normally I would have to do convert it to a string. So I would use show and then show converts n to a string and then print line prints it. Um, because print uh, put uh, string line expects one parameter, but I'm passing two parameters. I either have to use brackets or I have to use the dollar sign. So we already had that. So let's let me use the dollar sign. And then with get line, uh, if you try to do this, so let's say I want to get a line, and um, I said uh, line is um, get line. Um, if this function here returns uh, IO action uh, and this function, let's let's check it out. So if I go to, okay, so that will not compile. So let me finish with saying put string line um, the end. All right, so now we have, we have the whole thing compiling. So if I go to the GHSI, all right. So let me make it bigger. Whoops. Okay. So um, if I do main, now it will. Um, print hello, uh, print the uh, the world. So it, it does one line, second line. Uh, it prints the number as we expect. And then it should ask me for a line and prints this. But as you've seen, it didn't really ask me for anything, right? Uh, it didn't ask me for anything because Haskell is lazy and I'm not doing anything with the line. So Haskell says, well, you know, uh, we can do that. It's an IO action, which needs to be done, but because you're not doing anything with it, uh, you know, uh, we don't care. 
So it kind of goes through and gets to this point uh, without getting hang on in here. So you, you already see it's not really an imperative way because an imperative program, if I said, get me a line from, a, from the uh, terminal, from the standard input, the program will, will block here, right? So the program doesn't block because I'm not doing anything with line. So it's the same, you know, if, if you say, um, if you say, uh, let uh, large number, okay? Um, so a large number is a very, very large, large number and it equals to a last element of an infinite sequence, right? So if I say to Haskell, look, I have this infinite sequence, I want to get the last element of it, and it's called large number. Uh, in the imperative program, of course, you're gonna get here, get stuck here forever, right? Uh, but in, in Haskell, if we reload it uh, and run main, nothing, nothing strange happens. It goes, prints this line, prints this line, prints this line, says, okay, I'm gonna get something from the keyboard, from the console when you, I need to do something with the line, but because we're not doing anything with the line, that never gets actioned. And then it says, okay, I'm gonna get you the last number from the infinite sequence if you need it, but because we're not using it, you know, it, it, it never happens neither, right? So the laziness here makes this code look like imperative code, but it's already not imperative. Um, okay, so uh, we don't need the largest number in, in the universe and we um, really don't want an action uh, but we want, so if I uh, try to show you, so let's say we put string, uh, string line uh, to show what line is. So we're gonna uh, use the line, uh, but um, if I try to show, show the line, um, the compiler uh, tells me, look, uh, there is no instance for IO string, right? So if I if I ask what what is the type of get line, uh, it tells me well get line doesn't take any parameters and it returns an IO string. So it basically means there is a string which get line returns, but it's wrapped inside this IO monad. Uh, so if I try to show this, it says show doesn't know how to show it because there is no instance for, uh, you know, for that type. So this type IO string doesn't implement the show type class, right? So, and it doesn't have a show method, so I cannot show it. And, you know, if, if you think about it, I don't really want an IO string. I want the string, which this action gives me. So there is a different syntax for getting something that is inside a IO monad where you're using the do syntax and this this syntax is um, the back arrow from the IO action, right? So this syntax means whatever um, this returns, I want to get what's inside of that of that monad. So inside of that monad we have a string. So now line will be the string which that line returns. okay? Uh, I hope it, it kind of makes some sense. Uh, so the let would work, but the let would give me the IO action with the string inside it, but I need to extract it out and I, I'm extracting it out using this, this notation. So now if I, and because this is a string, I don't need to show it anymore. I can just print it, right? So um, let's concatenate it with, um, you have entered, and then we concatenate those two things. And again, uh, again, this function takes one, one argument and I have two, right? I have this, I actually have three arguments. I have this, this, and this. So I have to either use the dollar sign or I have to use brackets. So if I, I can use brackets and I can say, all of this is just one single thing and put string takes this, or I can say, do everything behind on the right hand side of the dollar sign first 
So do this concatenation first and then pass it to put string as, a, as an argument. So those two notations are the same. All right, so if we reload it and if I run main again, now you see it hangs. So after printing four, um, so it prints hello, prints world, uh, prints the four, and at this point it waits for me to return line. Uh, and then I can say Marius and press enter. And then it prints, you have entered without a, a space. So it says you have entered Marius and then it prints the end. Make sense? I hope it's not too, too hard. Um, what else can we do here? Um, I can, let's get rid of the printing for um let's for now get rid of the other lines and how would this look like in a functional style well uh you would have to have a functional composition right so you would have to have some sort of function which calls another function which calls another function which then does something and then that's the end of your program right so it would be basically a function which takes some arguments and the arguments to the function could be other functions and then that's your program, right? That's what the do notation kind of makes out of this syntactic sugar. So in this particular case, um, we have two function calls and we have put string, which takes this argument. So I have put string, which is my one function. And then I have this function, which is another function, but you know, this is not a parameter to this. Uh, th there is no relationship between those two functions, right? So we see we kind of need uh, some sort of relationship to make it into a single function. Uh, and that normally that relationship, so if I, let's say, okay, so I will do, and we have put string line the end, right? Um, so if I have two functions, so I have a function called f uh, and the function f, um, yeah, let's say it, it takes an int and it doubles it. So we, I have a function f which takes an int and returns an int and it just doubles the int. And then I have a function g which adds one to, to something, okay? Very, very simple function. So again, this one takes an int, returns an int and G. Uh, so let's call it G1 and let's call it F2 such that this double a number, this just adds one to it. So I have A again um, and this function will be A plus one, okay? So now I have those two functions and I need to do them in a functional style. So I want, let's say I want a function fun, which is a composition of those two functions. So it's a function which does those two things. So it takes a number, it first doubles it, and then adds one to it. How would that function look like? So in Haskell, the, um, the operator which combines two functions together is just dot. Um, in normal, like uh, imperative programming, uh, I would say, okay, I, so let's let's write it in Golang, right? So I have a func fun, which takes an i, which is an int, and returns an int. And my function would be, I have to take f2 um, and run i with it. So I will get a, a temporary variable temp, which is uh, the you know, doubling of the number. And then I would get the resulting value, which would be G1 on the temporary variable. And then I can return a result, right? So that would be sort of the, uh, I call F2 on I, then I get a, a par partial result. And then I call G1 on this, right? So I double the number and add one to it. Um, but of course you can write it in a more succinct way. So you could, in, in Golang, of course, you can say this, return uh, g1 of f2 of i, right? So this is your 
um, this is your functional composition. So I'm doing F, F2 first, and then I'm doing G1, and then I'm returning the value, right? So this is kind of uh, the, the same as in Haskell saying my fun equals um, do G1 after you've done F2. So do F2 first, and then pass the result to G1, and then the result of that is the result of fun. You notice that I'm not having a parameter here. So I can add the parameter. So I can say fun i. So let's write fun type is int and returns an int. Uh, and then fun i takes i and it composes those two functions together. And then it calls them on, on i, right? So um, I have the composition of functions, which make, gives me a single function, and then it calls it on i. This is the same. Um, so again, if, if you want to write it in a more imperative way, if you think in a more imperative way, what you would do is you would say fun i equals, I'm calling g1 after I've called f2 on i, right? So f2 of, of, on i gives me a value, which is passed to g1, which is then computed, and that's the result of this function. Those two notations are exactly the same, uh, with the first one being more explicit about the composition of the functions, right? Because I am actually here, I have a single function, which takes one argument and returns me the same as this, this composition here. Th those are exactly the same. Like for the compiler, those two are exactly the same. It just looks, the syntax looks slightly different, right? Um, and because they are exactly the same, and because this function takes one argument, which I have on left-hand side and right-hand side, I can get rid of it. So uh, this is called point free function declarations. So even though fun takes one fun one uh, um, it takes one argument I'm saying fun actually doesn't take any arguments uh, because what I'm saying now is that fun is a function which doesn't take any arguments and returns a function which takes one argument and returns a, an argument it takes a number and returns a number right uh, the way you put the brackets in Haskell doesn't matter. So this, um, the uh, the grouping. If, if I have, you know, if I have some type. So let's let's have another fun two, which takes um, which takes two numbers, and returns a number. Okay. Um, so fun two can be thought of either as a function which takes two numbers and returns a number, or as a function which takes one number and returns a, another function which takes one number and returns a number. Um, so th this is a binary function and uh, an example of a binary function is plus, right? So plus takes um, two numbers, a and b, and returns a, a third number, right? But if I, if I say this, so um, I can say that I let uh, M to be equal to one, one plus, right? I didn't specify the second argument. I just specify the first argument. So now M is a function which adds one to something, right? M so the signature of M, uh, if I write what is the type of M, is a function which takes an integer and returns an integer, um, because I M takes one parameter, which is the missing parameter for the addition, and gives me the value. Um, so this th this is again uh, a kind of a fundamental aspect of Haskell and on functional programming about carrying. So carrying is a way of you um, looking at the function which takes multiple parameters in a way that suits your program 
uh, such that you don't have to look at functions that always take the same number of parameters. So in terms like let's let's define fun in Golang for addition, and let's say it takes a and b as integers and returns the integers, and it takes you know a plus b and returns me the the the, the value, right? So here we have a normal function in Golang that adds two numbers. The same function in Haskell. So I have add uh, a and b, and it's a plus b. And the type of this function is uh, add takes an integer, another integer, and returns me an integer. Uh, and this, those two again are equivalent. Th those are exactly the same. But there is a difference that in Golang, I only have a single function which takes two arguments, and that's it. I cannot call in Golang, I cannot say um, I have um, a function f that's at with one parameter, and then I want to say f called with 10, right? So I cannot say that um, my variable x equals f with 10 because I cannot do this. I cannot do partial application of parameters. I can only call it with all the parameters that this function takes. In Haskell, that's not the case. In Haskell, I can call at without any parameters. And then what I'm going to get is I'm going to get a function. So if I say, you know, let f equals at, I mean, f now is a function which takes two parameters, a and b, and returns me the sum. If I say f is a function that takes, which is like this, uh, that means f now is a function which takes one parameter, which is the missing one from the addition, and again returns me a number. Or if I call it like this, then it says, okay, add is basically already filled up, uh, and it will return me an int, and f will be an int, right? So you, I, I hope you're getting it that the brackets, like I can say at is this, or I can say at is this, or I can say at is this, and they are all equivalent. That's why we don't use brackets here because you can interpret it as if the brackets were there, but you don't have to. So the typical way of interpreting it is, um, is actually like this, that add takes two integers and returns an integer. And that's the normal way of thinking about it. And that's the normal way of thinking about it in, Go in Golang as well. But if I say, no, actually, I really want to use this function as like this. Um, and I don't need those brackets, but I can think about it like the brackets are there. That means that um, this function only takes one argument and it returns me a function which takes, um, which does this, right? So I can think of it as a function which only takes one argument and returns me a, a function which takes one argument and returns me the sum of this and this. And that would be the implementation of it then, right? I can implement it like this if I think of it in this way. Uh, and again, those are equivalent, they are exactly the same, and they're exactly the same for the compiler to, to, to do the, the uh, compilation. So this is, I mean, if, if, you, if someone explains it to you and you, you kind of understand that you, you have an ability to generate a function out of the partial parameter list. So it's like doing that in Golang. I cannot do that in Golang, but if I could, it would be the same as in Haskell. In Haskell, you can do that. Uh, so in Haskell, I can call it without any parameters, with one parameter or with two parameters. And if I call it with, uh, without any parameters, that means that's the, basically the same. F is the same as at. It takes two parameters, and then it returns a sum. If I call it with one parameter, then F takes one missing parameter and returns the sum. If I call it with two parameters that already calculates the sum and this is just an int. So this is just the, the final, uh, sorry, the, the final part of the, of the type signature. 
We don't put the brackets typically, uh, although we often do for explaining what functions do, right? So for example, if I, um, if I ask what is the type of map and map is a function which takes another function, you will see that I see the brackets here, right? So map takes a function which takes one argument and returns one argument and does something with a race. Uh, so you, you, you do see those brackets, but if the, if the brackets were not here, it would be exactly the same. You don't really need them. Uh, it's just the, a way for communicating what is expected or what is the typical use. If I call map with, um, with um, just with A and B, A and B are missing, it will be a function which instead of taking two things and returning the third thing, uh, it would take this partial thing and it would wait for B, A and B to be passed into it, okay? Um, yeah, we, we will spend some time on map as well, but um, I really want to get this kind of a function composition uh, communicated such that you get an intuition of, of what it is. So do you have, you, you know, if, if you don't get it, just raise your hand. If, In, in C++ and in, in Golang, we don't have this ability to do this carrying so, so much. We have to do the carrying by adding anonymous functions. So for example, if I were, um, yeah, let's, um, let's do it. So I have my fun. I have my Haskell version and Golang, Golang version. And now I want to do something like this in, in um, in, Husk, in Golang, then I need to have, uh, you know, I have to use an anonymous function to that. I cannot just say at one, I have to say, well, okay, I want to generate a function. So I have to say func, and then this func will take one argument. So I will say it takes B, which is an int, and what it does, and it and returns an int, and what it does, it, it basically, um, calls add with um, yeah so um, yeah what, what we're doing is we have um, we want to say f equals at I want to have a function which just increments something by one right so in we, we're trying to do in in Golang something that in, in Haskell would be uh, like this. Right, so um, so a plus b, that's our normal thing. And now in Haskell, we want to do a function which is just an increment by one. So we say a one, right? So in Haskell, that that's what we need to do. In Golang, we have to say, okay, we we want a function which takes one argument and then increments it by one by saying one b right and then this is the the closure for f so now f is the same in golang as it is in haskell so the notation in haskell is kind of a uh, much more succinct in golang we have to do a bit more boilerplate because we have to generate this anonymous function which takes one parameter and then it feeds it to this function which actually always takes two parameters right um, this is done behind the scenes by, by Haskell because we can do this. And in C++ it's the same. In C++ you would have to do this as well. All right, so that's kind of a, a bit of a longish detour uh, into the carrying and functions. What we wanted to, to, to do is this composition, right? So let's get back to, to our composition of um, the two put strings. So again, um, I have my main, I have a put string line, hello, and I have put string line world. And now like, you know, how can I compose those two together that this one is done and then this one is done. 
uh, and again with with monads you have the function which looks like this and it basically says you know do this Th this is a function which takes two two parameters left hand side and right hand side and it basically says okay i'm going to evaluate this and then i'm going to evaluate this and i'm going to return what this one returns right so in um Without the do notation, if you want to sequence and compose all those functions into a single function, that's how it look. That's how it would look like. And then what you could do is you could say, okay, I want to um, do an expression, so I I could sequence it with the let expression, which gets me a line and then prints that line. But as you see, that would sort of start looking a little bit. Um, so I can have a let expression here. So I could say let line. Um, and then to get the line out of the get line is a little bit tricky um, because I would have to use another symbol for getting to extract the line out of the IO string. Because remember, get line gives us IO string. Uh, so this is already quite cumbersome to, to be done here. Uh, you can do it and this do, uh, do notation kind of converts into something like this, but you don't need to kind of deal with it because you do have this do notation, right? So you can do sequence of operations using the, the do notation instead. Uh, and you can think of this as kind of a composing the or sequencing the functions together. We, we will talk a little bit more about this later as well. All right, so there is certain complexity to, to deal with those with all those concepts and like not everything can be taught at once. So if you get kind of just some intuitions and some ability to use it, then that's enough, okay? So the you know abilities that I want you to, to do here is that you can print stuff to the screen you can get stuff out of the uh, console, um, and then you can do something with the with the strings. Um, so you can um, yeah, you can print it, right? Okay. So um, what else can we do with the command line? So printing stuff is nice. Um, what um we have is we can get line but we can also get the entire content of the um of the uh, input so if i say get content instead of getting um getting me a single line it will uh contents it will get me kind of the entire input from the command line, not line by line, but the whole thing at once. Okay, so if I like, I'm not gonna print hello world. I'm gonna get everything and I'm gonna print everything. So let's let's run that. Uh, let's delete the, the fun functions. Okay, so if I reload, reload and I call main uh, it doesn't print anything it waits so I say uh, Marius is teaching a class and this is the second line and then I'm doing control D uh, to close the uh, the stream and it looks kind of ugly so let's kill it and let's uh, run it from the uh, compiled version. So the way that it looks so ugly is because um, the the REPL, the interpreter loop, uh, kind of interprets what is um, what the main is doing and then kind of communicates with me, right? So here, if I say Marius is teaching a class and there is a second line and then I, I do control D uh, you will see that I kind of quit so that the stream quit uh, but it didn't print 
So it kind of printed at the end of the line, um, the first line, and then at the end of the line, the second line. So even though I'm getting the whole contents, uh, it is kind of doing this in a lazy way by buffering up to the end of the line, right? So get contents kind of gets me uh, the whole thing, but because I'm I'm printing um, the uh, the contents uh, and it buffered up to the end to the to the first end of the line, it kind of looks like I'm doing it in a loop, line by line, but it, it's just a side effect of the of the laziness of the language. Right, so I'm not really doing it line by line, but it kind of looks like I'm doing it line by line. So what I can do is I can um, say, okay, um, get me everything first, and then uh, I want I don't want to print the line. I want to say I have the all, and all is. Unlines line. So unlines takes, okay, let's uh, have a quick look. So this may not compile because I need something. I need the main function needs to return an IO action. And this statement, so the, the function will return whatever the last statement is. And this statement is not returning an IO action, so such that it says, oh yeah, you're doing something wrong. So I have to, I can return an empty IO action uh, or I can um, do something else, right? So uh, yeah, so that that's also, um, yeah, so uh, let's see, info get, Contents and get contents uh, returns a string, uh, which is a single string of all the stuff that you have uh, with the um, with the lines character kind of attached to it. But as we've seen, it's it's kind of uh, um, producing. Um, producing uh, the output kind of line by line. Lines takes a string. So what is lines? Um, lines takes a string and checks where is the end of line character and produces me an array of all those lines. So lines will take uh, get contents and then get give me all the, uh, all the lines in, a, in an array. Um, such that I can do something with it. So I can say get contents. So I don't need that line. So I can compose those two things. So I can say, um, yeah, actually, actually the, the original one is easier for you for now. Uh, otherwise I would have to introduce an extra thing. So let's say it's, um, Everything is get contents, and then uh, lines is um, it's um, come on. So this will give me a, a list of all the lines which I have in my program, right? So list of lines, and then I can. Um, try to print it. So I can uh, print list of lines. Okay, so let's try to reload it and call main. So now main is waiting. Uh, yeah, so again, I uh, it's a little bit awkward to play with it in the uh, REPL. It's better just to run it. So Let's run it, and then if I start typing, so I say Mariusz, okay. Mariusz has a class that is second line. Okay, so now as you see, it didn't give me any output line by line. It waits for the 
the entire end of the stream. So uh, this is the final line. And then if I press Control D, that's the end of the stream. And then the processing will start. And the processing will start and it says, uh, Mariusz has a class, which is the first line. And that's the second line. And this is the final line. So it split all the input into lines and put lines in my list one by one, OK? Uh, so I have the first line, second line, and last line. And the end of line characters are gone. So if I uh, run it again, and I say Mariusz, uh, Charlie, and then I press Enter a couple of times, empty, empty lines, and call it, kill it with Control D, you will see that empty lines are represented as empty strings, right? So uh, I have the first line, second line, third line, fourth line, fifth line, and that's it. I had five lines kind of entered. All right, so you, you kind of get contents and how it buffers line by line and also how you can convert it into, um, into lines, like a list of lines. So if we take this list of lines now, um, we can uh, do something with the lines themselves. So I can, um, I can, for example, um, take the, I can, uh, so let, let's say I want to um, split. So I have now line by line and each line has some words and I want to split the, the line into individual words. So let's go back to, to our simpler version. So let's read the, the, um, just the first line, OK? So if I get the line, so I get line. And now I have a, a text, which is my line. And I want to split it into list of words, right? So I want to split it into a list of, of words. Let and this is just command which is called words. So I can say uh, my list of words is words out of the line. So that if I when I say uh, print well, put string length list um, list of words and I will not put string. I will just say print. Then. Um, if we run it, so okay. So Marius has a class. It has four words. Marius has a class. I press enter, and then I get a list which says Marius has a class, right? So it it splits the um the line into words and then we get the list of those words what i can do on those words is i can um, now try to uh, process them uh, so imagine that they are numbers so if i if i rerun it and i say one two three four uh, i get one two three four as a list of strings what if I want to convert this list of strings to a list of ints, right? So um, let's write a function. So let's say convert, and this function will take a list of strings and give me a, a list, a list of ints, right? So convert uh, takes a head and a tail of the list of strings and it will return. Um, so to convert something to a type, you can use read. So show converts something to a string and read converts something. Uh, so show converts something to a string and read converts string to something. Uh, that sometimes may not work, but if it works, it, it works. So uh, what, what we will do is we will convert x to an int. Uh, read is a polymorphic function. And the, because it's a polymorphic function, we cannot just say read x, 
because then read doesn't know what to expect. You know, how should it parse it? Should it parse it as int or should it parse it as, you know, float or what? Um, if we tell it parse it as int, it will fail if the input is not int. Otherwise it will give us an int. And then we need to con uh, concatenate this with convert the rest of the list, right? So we have a, a simple conversion function, which takes a list of strings and converts the head, the first, first element into an int and then converts the rest uh, because it's using the um, recursion. We have to say convert of an empty list is an empty list such that we have an end condition, right? So now if I, uh, yeah, so it says we could do the same with a map, but I, I wanted to show you the recursive version first. So now if we, if we run it and I give it a one, two, three, four, like we did before. So I'm gonna call it with one, two, three, four, same as before. Um, one, two, three, four, I press enter. Uh, yeah, we didn't convert it. So uh, let, let list of ints be converted list of words, right? So we converting list of words into the list of, of ints. So if I run this time, I what I want is I want to have a list of ints, not a list of strings. Um, so then one, two, three, four. I'm printing the wrong thing, list of words, list of ints. Okay. One more time. All right. So one, two, three, four. And voila, we have uh, a list of ints instead of the list of strings, right? Uh, that's great. There is a simpler way of doing this conversion. So when I have my, um, you see that all I need to do is I need to call this function on each element of the of my list. And we've seen before that there is a, a map function which takes a, a function which converts something to something else, applies it. Um, yeah, let's let me show you how map looks like. So map. So how maps works is like this. Um, it takes a function which converts type A to type B. So it takes you know a single element and converts it from A to B, and then it takes a, a list of A's and converts it to a list of B's, right? Which is perfect in our case, because what we have is we have a list of strings and we want a list of ints and we have a function which converts an int into a string, right? So instead of calling conv and defining this function, what we can say is we want to map read x of int into uh, the list of words, right? So we want to map this function uh, into this list uh, because, um, you know, I need to pass a function, not a function with a parameter. I, I'm not interested in calculating anything like in that spot. I want uh, this to be applied to the elements of that uh, of that list, then I will. Um, yeah. So let's see. So that will work, but it's an ambiguous read. So we have to specify um, the type of what we expect that read to actually read. Um, I may need to define a lambda. So let me just define a, a lambda and say it's an int. Um, so I have now a function which takes a single argument and converts an 
um, a string into an int, and this function is being mapped over the list of words, right? Uh, because I have to do this type thing, I, I, I have to have the lambda function. So what is lambda? Lambda is kind of like an anonymous function. Uh, you do have anonymous functions and lambdas in C++, in Golang and in, in Haskell. In Haskell, they use this kind of a slash notation, which is followed by parameters, which is followed by the uh, definition and then um, the def definition of the function, right? So this is what the, the lambda returns. You don't need to specify the types of the lambdas because the compiler will kind of infer it. And then if we do that, then we can delete this and then we have the same, uh, yeah, let me quit that. Let me run this. We, we ba basically will achieve the same result without this extra definition of the function because we kind of inlined the, the logic of reading the elements in here. So if I say one, two, three, I get one, two, three as numbers. All right, so um, there is uh, one um, other small thing that I wanted to introduce today, uh, which is the, so let's go back, let's go back to our conversion. So this conversion can fail, right? So if I run it, Ah, uh, crap, uh, that may not, uh, no, it will compile. Okay, so if I say one, two, three, it works. But if I say one, two, mama, it says, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, no parse, which means that line, which reads an int crashed, right? Uh, so, okay, so let's, let's not use the map. Um, Let's use our conversion because it's a little bit easier to explain um, what's happening. Uh, so our conversion converts strings into ints, but um, let's change it in such a way that it takes a single string and converts it into a single int, okay? So uh, if the string is empty, um, we have to decide what should what should we do, right? So first of all, we have to decide what to do if the string is empty. What should we re return? And second of all, we need to decide. Um, so now I I just have x. Then I have to decide uh, what to do if this fails, right? So. Um, So I have my uh, conversion. Um, I have a case which is an empty string. Uh, what should it return? And then I have a case where I have something, but this can fail. What should I do? Uh, in Golang, um, so in Golang, what, what you would do is you would say, OK, I have a conversion function. So I have a func uh, conversion, and I want to convert from uh, s, which is a string into an int and then it could fail because if if I have uh, s so if s equals an empty string then you know we're gonna return whatever we you know return an, uh, a zero and we're gonna return an error right so we usually do it like uh, saying okay I'm gonna have um, conversion returning me something but if there is an error or if you passed me an empty string, I'm going to return a default value for ints uh, or whatever whatever you want. You, you, you can return minus one or whatever. Like it doesn't matter because I also going to return an error. And then if if there is a normal case, I'm going to return, um, you know, the, uh, the x, which is the converted number and nil, right? So then in my code, Later on, everywhere I say convert me some, convert some string to a number, and I say number equals this. I I have to say okay, and I will say if okay, if not okay, then I have to deal with the error, right? So this is the typical pattern that you do with with Golang, and this is the typical way of dealing with errors in Golang. 
and they lead this way of dealing with errors leads to this you know abundance of if statements where you have to deal with you know um, propagation of, of your errors so the the way you deal with errors in Haskell is different um, so because conversion can convert me a string to an int but int may not happen. Like I may not get an int out of this function. So there is a type called maybe. Uh, and maybe is, a, is an amazing uh, simple concept. Um, so maybe is defined like a data type uh, and it equals just, so it's parameterized um, by a particular type such you can have a maybe int or maybe string or maybe whatever and then you can either have this whatever just whatever or you get nothing and but nothing is also of that type so it is kind of like a parameterized nil okay uh in uh in c plus plus if i say i have um if i if i have a pointer to an int and it's an uh, and if it's a null, or if I have a pointer to a person, right? So I have a person pointer, and it's a null. Uh, you cannot distinguish this null from this null because it's always the same null. Uh, but in Haskell, if I say I have got nothing, uh, it has a kind of a strong type, and you can distinguish between the different types of of nothingness, so to say. All right. So um, instead of returning an int, I'm going to return a maybe int. And then if I pass it uh, an empty string, I will say, OK, I, I get nothing. Uh, but if I pass it um, this, I will get just, just, just the um, yeah, just the value. Right. So now um, when we do this conversion, uh, so now I change the conversion to be not a list of strings to a list of ints. I just have a simple function of string to maybe ints. And now we can map it. So we, uh, again, we can map it uh, to our list of words and get our list of this time. It's not a list of ints, but it's a list of maybe ints. Right. So if I run it uh, and we pass it, um, we pass it one, two, three. Um, okay. So yeah, one, two, three. It's going to give me just one, just two, just three. If I say one, two, uh, whoops, let's run it again. So if I say one, two, three, mama, four, five, uh, yeah, so that, that blows up because <laughs> I, I haven't changed the reading. So um, read still tries to read it into an int and then it blows up if uh, int doesn't happen. But there is a, a nicer version of of read, which is called read maybe, uh, and read maybe uh, returns a maybe maybe types, uh, and that means I can get um, uh, let's see, yeah, it's defined in the text read, so I have to import import text read, and maybe read. Uh, will return me a, a maybe int if there was no error or it will return me just an int if there was no error or nothing if there was an error, right? So let's, uh, let's rerun it. But before I rerun it, um, let me define a new function. So let me define, um, so let's, let's change it such that I have a function called uh, process line and the process line takes takes a string line and gives me a string line and uh, the, the the definition will be process line takes a string s 
and it does this. So it takes, it splits the S into list of words. Uh, so we need to have a let expression. So we need to rewrite it to let expression. And then it's gonna convert it and it's gonna uh, in return, return me this string. Okay. And then in our main, we will change it such that main uh, equals, and there is a, a nice function called interact, which takes another function, which takes a function string to string, uh, process line, and then feeds line by line into the process line, such that we can get kind of a more interactive processing done line by line. So let's, um, let's run it. Yeah, so at print doesn't work in this place. We need to use show. Yeah, I have uh, I have a call. Just give me a second. All right, so if we pass three numbers, uh, we gonna get the just just the numbers. If we pass it, uh, if I pass it with an error, then for the error places, I'm gonna get nothing but the list is still of the same type. So, you know, you cannot hold multiple different things in the list um, such that we cannot mix like say text and numbers. But in here, I just have a list of just ints or of maybe ints. And then every time I, I do a correct processing, I have just one. And every time I got an error, I have, um, I have the nothing for it, right? So we have kind of a useful, two useful things uh, here. We have the map, which we can use to map a function over something. Uh, map is, you know, present in other programming languages like JavaScript and and uh, Python and, and so on. It's not a very unique to Haskell, but it's kind of a very useful useful function, and. Another useful function is um, filter. So filter takes um, a Boolean function and keeps the element in the list if the Boolean function gives true and removes it if the Boolean function does, uh, um, does uh, false. So, Yeah, so maybe int doesn't behave exactly like an int. It behaves like this kind of mon monadic thing, which has something inside it, right? So same as IO has something inside, uh, sa the same as with maybe int, it has an int inside of it, right? So let me uh, very quickly 
yeah, like, uh, le let me just finish with the filter. So uh, what we want is we want to filter out all the nothings from here and just keep the, um, the, the list. So with filter, what we could do is we could say uh, filtered uh, list. Uh, let's call it filtered list of ints, <laughs> okay? And uh, what we can do is we can call filter and then we would need to have uh, a lambda. So it takes an X uh, and the X has now two possibilities. Uh, it's either nothing or it is um, just something, right? So what we can do is we can say case of X of and if the X is of nothing, uh, then return. Um, yeah, so we uh, return false. And um, if it's just, just something, returns true. And that may work. I'm using the semicolon such that I can have everything in one line. Uh, normally you would sort of split it, but let's see if that works. And then I filter the list of ints into this new list. And this is our filtered, filtered list of ints. Uh, let me see if that works. So in Haskell, you can uh, use uh, curly braces and semicolons to block, to um, organize your code the same way as you would in C++. But normally we split it and we kind of use this Python-like notation with the alignment on the columns. So now if I say one, two, three, mama, okay. Uh, you see, I, I just got one, two, three, but mama is filtered out. So let's run it again. So one, two, A, B, C, three, oh, three, four, five, some other errors, six, seven. Um, then I only get just one to seven, but I have all the errors, all the input, which was not number filtered out. Okay, so there was a question if, if maybe ints behave the same as, as ints. Uh, let's go into the um the REPL. So if I say A is uh, just one and B is just two, I cannot say A plus B. Uh, this I cannot say because just types are not numbers. Uh, we will talk ab uh, about it next week um, and we will talk about how to deal with the values which are wrapped in some context. In this case, we, we are kind of, we have values wrapped in the context of just, right? Because I, I also have C, right? So if I have C and C is nothing, uh, then um, A is just one, B is just two, and C is nothing, and they are all of the same type. I could say A plus C, right? What should happen when I say A plus C? Uh, what, what, what should be the result? Well, the result should be probably nothing because I cannot add one to nothing and get something. I, I probably have nothing, right? So there is a way to do that. Um, I can give you a spoiler. Uh, the spoiler is by applying the plus, uh, but using kind of um, a different notation for the plus operator. So I would say, okay, apply plus to values which are maybes, maybe something, uh, and A and C are, are maybe values. And you use the this symbol for saying, apply this function to those parameters, and you use this symbol to, di uh, to distinguish between the parameters. Uh, so now if I do that, I will get nothing because A plus C, you know, uh, I have just one plus nothing is nothing. If I say A plus A, I should get just two. So just one plus just two is just, uh, just one plus just one is just two. If I say just one plus just two, I will get three, right? So that kind of works, but there is a little bit of magic happening of how this plus, because plus, you know, the type of plus, um, 
the type of plus is it takes a number. It doesn't take maybe number, it takes a number, right? The function plus takes a number, another number and gives us a number. Uh, whereas here I have uh, just a number or just int, another just int and the plus works, right? And those two symbols make, make it work because we're lifting it to this kind of a monadic layer. Um, all right, we, we going, um, Yeah, so uh, there is a question from Thomas. If we can filter it again and uh, convert the, um, so if I say filter again, and this time I'm taking again, uh, I'm taking an X. Um, so I would kind of have similar filter to this filter, uh, but instead of um, dealing with the, yeah, so I, I would have, let, let me quickly write it. So I, I take an X, which is a just X. Uh, and then I would say that I need to extract the int out of it. And then you have kind of a, a question of how you're gonna extract. Um, so let's call, uh, let's call it function extract, which takes a maybe int and gives us an int. Right, uh, so extract will take uh, a value. So extract has two cases. It has a nothing case and it has extract just number case. So the just number case is easy. We just return a number, but what should we do with nothing? Um, we could give it a default value. So we could give it zero uh, and assume that after this filter, we, we don't have any nothingness, right? We only have the proper values. So then we can say ex extract X, right? So I can filter, um, I can filter twice and get the, um, the list of numbers. So let's reload that. Um, let's quit this. Let me see. I need to say I will have a dollar sign here. Um, we don't need those braces probably, but let's keep them for uh, brevity. All right, let's try. Uh, X. Yeah, so um, filter is uh, leaving some stuff in. What we want is a map, right? We don't want to filter stuff out of the list and keep it smaller by removing elements. We want to convert it to a different list. So we're basically taking the output of that filter and mapping it uh, with that uh, function to get a new, instead of a list of maybe ints, we want to get a list of ints. Um, uh, what we don't like here. You don't like this maybe. Yeah, sometimes the error messages, like the error messages about nothing, but there is nothing wrong with this line. It was, the error was here and yeah, it takes a little bit of pain to, to go through the syntax, the bracket syntax and the alignment and all of that. Anyway, so if I do one, two, three, and I say some rubbish and four and some rubbish, then um, we get a nice clean uh, list of ints out of the, mapping after the filter, right? So that, that's the answer to, to Thomas. Um, any other questions? So play with it. So play with the filtering, play with the mapping and play with the maybe type. The maybe type takes some, um, some getting used to uh, and the idea that you have a value which is an integer are uh, wrapped around this context that takes some practice. So you do need to kind of play with it a little bit. Um, and then next week we will, we will start with the, um, 
Yeah, we will start with basically re revising it and doing uh, FizzBuzz and trying to have a little bit of a fun with FizzBuzz and with the formatting of the output. Um, there is another type which is very useful, which is called either. Um, we will spend some time uh, next week on either as well. And either has a left and a right parts. Because with, with maybe, you don't know what went wrong. You only know that something didn't work and you have nothing value. Uh, with either, usually what you do, you, you kind of organize it in such a way that you have kind of an error on the left-hand side. Uh, and the right-hand side is your normal processing pipeline. And then you can kind of deal with the error situations in a more meaningful way. Uh, but in most cases, uh, in some cases, you know, maybes are enough. Uh, to deal with the with the errors. Okay, so um, that's all. We we sort of run out of time. Uh, I encourage you to watch the videos to keep reading the book. Uh, the book is quite good, and we will see each other on Tuesday next week, and we will continue with some of those um, with some of those concepts. Thank you very much.